Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shett, episode 535, and boy do I have a great interview for you. Uh, this is one for the ages, uh, because I have as my special guest, Mr. Jordan Mechner. Now, I hope you know who that is. He's only done some of the best, most innovative, and artistically great games of all time, uh, including Karataka, Prince of Persia, and The Last Express. Uh, he's also gone beyond gaming into movies uh, with his Prince of Persia movie, uh, as well as graphic novels like Replay, uh, which we'll get into in this episode. The guy's had a fantastic life. He's super smart, super philosophical. Uh, I just, <laughs> I'm just really excited to get to share this with you. I'm really honored uh, that he agreed uh, to this interview. I think you're really going to love it. Uh, so anyway, uh, without further ado, here is Mr. Jordan Mechner. There we go. Let's get this show on the road. Wow, good to see you, Jordan. What an honor it is to get to talk to you. Oh, I am thanks. so happy. <laughs> I mean, one of the, I mean, you've done such incredible work uh, with your games and your movies and your graphic novels. But <laughs> you know, one of my big interests is one of my big interests in life is uh, preserving game history. You know, telling the story of all this stuff. And you've probably done more than any developer i can think of in, in that regard so <laughs> thank you so much for that well you're you're very welcome that's very kind thank you yeah just let me get this uh, up here uh, so people can see so of course you've done replay a graphic novel memoir of an uprooted family and god this is a one of the most powerful things I've read about, not just about the games industry, but the way that you tie in, uh, yeah, uprooted. What a, you know, <laughs> is their family more uprooted than this? I don't know. Uh, but just a fantastic read, the emotional roller coaster of this thing. You know, you think you know what you're getting into uh, when you pick something like this up, but wow, there's a lot of, a lot of happy times in this, you know, but uh, quite a bit of sadness and, uh, tragedy and just you know we find ourselves in the political moment <laughs> that we're in now what what timely thing to be reading well you know this is a book that i uh, sort of had in the back of my mind for a long time you know i had a very happy and safe american childhood in new york you know growing up you know i was into comics and mad magazine as a kid and then when i was about 13 the apple II computer came along and just kind of you know, I got addicted to programming and playing games and wanting to make my own games. And that's basically what I did for the next 30 years. Uh, so I sort of wanted to do some kind of memoir to tell the story of, you know, my early career making games, you know, like Karateka and Prince of Persia mm -hmm. on you know those old computers and, you know, the game industry the way it was then. But, I, you know, I had this, there was this family backstory you know, that I'd sort of grown up knowing about, which was my, you know, my dad was a child refugee in World War I. My grandfather had fought, you know, on the losing side of World War I for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so these incredible stories of survival, you know, were kind of, you know, I'd never experienced anything like that, war or dislocation or uprooting, but, uh, but it was sort of there in the background. So I, I wanted to sort of do a book that would sort of tell both of those stories and kind of put, you know, juxtapose them. I think it succeeded. Do you mind if I show a few pages from this? Oh, absolutely. People get a sense of what this looks like. Because, of course, it is a graphic novel. And you do, I don't know, maybe we could get into, like, your influences, other graphic novels or uh, artists and you know, writers in that genre that have influenced you. Let me, yeah, here we go. Yeah, the first page. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I had to put this down a few times. It just got to me. There's just a lot going on here. Yeah, there's, it's a there's very complex narrative. You know, you got all of these different threads going on and different periods of history kind of existing. Uh, it's not a sequential narrative. Yeah, it, it's a it's a dense narrative. I, I, I tried to make it at least simple for the reader to follow by using three palettes. So there you saw the sepia on the first two pages, uh, you know, sh showing my dad seven years old in Vienna in 1938, you know, at the moment that his, his parents realized that they had to get out of Austria uh, to save their lives, you know, with the Nazi uh, seizure of power. And then the next page, the palette changes to blue 
you know, and we're in 1978, where my grandfather now, you know, retired as a doctor in Brooklyn, uh, you know, in his uh, late 70s, has written a family memoir, which he's brought. And this, that's the year that I got my first Apple II computer and started programming. I drew Space Invaders there in the first panel. But my hope is that by seeing the color scheme change from sepia which you know is the color of old photos and old newsreels to blue, which for me is the color of computer screens and the uh, oh sure and the Apple II. That the the reader will kind of get the the uh, the convention, and e even without it being explained, will just sort of feel turning the pages like you sort of know whether you're in a sepia sequence or a blue sequence, oh. and then yellow. Uh, uh, oh, oh, sorry, there is uh, at the chapter heads. I put a photograph of. Uh, you know, from that period. Those are the only photographs in the book, but here's uh, my dad and my grandfather, you know, as they actually were in that time period, just after they fled Vienna. So then on the, on the next page there, the uh, there's the third color palette, uh, yellow, which is the present day. And that's sort of the frame story of the book. And it's the reason that I call it replay. Because seven years ago, I moved from Los Angeles where, you know, I'd spent the last 15 years, you know, as a uh, you know, that's where I was when I, you know, did the Sands of Time uh, with Ubisoft commuting between uh, LA and Montreal. And that's where my kids, you know, were born and grew up and where I was, uh, you know, worked as a screenwriter, you know, writing the Prince of Persia movie, you know, among other projects. So yellow is the present day. It's the, the you know, the son of Los Angeles and, and then Montpellier in the south of France, where I moved to, uh, is is yellow as well. So there's those three colors, sepia, blue, and yellow. And so when you see yellow, it's the the frame story, which I and uh mentioned the title replay. I mean, of course, in video games, you know, replay is you know something that uh, the player does. But in, uh I realized after moving to France that in a sense I had done the same thing that my grandparents did, but in reverse. That is, they crossed the Atlantic and relocated, uh, you know, their young kids. Of course, they did it for survival to to flee a, a war, you know a war and to a brutal dictatorship and save their lives and save their kids' lives. I did it for a. Uh, an exciting professional opportunity to make a video game, you know, in complete safety. So they're not comparable, but there's still this, once I got here, once I got to France, uh, I realized that I was in the country where my dad had spent those years of his childhood as a refugee uh, in France under the Nazi occupation. Uh, and and that like him, I was on the, the seaside, you know, I'm, I'm on the Mediterranean uh, in Montpellier. He finished uh, his you know, Odyssey in France in 1941 in Nice, which is also, you know, in the, in the south of France on the coast. So uh, there's this kind of weird mi mirror image of my present day story and his story of the past. So the title replay and the three color palettes. Yeah, that's, I think there's, you know, the red for the Nazis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Red is a color that I used very sparingly throughout, but, but for, you know, for a very specific reason here, it represents the, you know, the Nazi flag. And uh, later I use it for, you know, for other things, but it, it always represents, uh, you know, the same thing, uh, you know, a, a government that's basically trying to kill its its own citizens. Hmm. Yeah, I've read, I'm sure you're familiar with the Scott McCloud and his understanding comics. You know, I, I was thinking about that because, you know, there's so much to comics and graphic novels that I don't, you know, casual readers probably don't pay much attention to, but the techniques and the conventions you're talking about that maybe you're not consciously aware of them, but they're there and they're just, you know, really ratcheting up everything and really showing what this medium can do. I, mean, I think a graphic novel is, you know, like a video game, you know, it's sort of a contract between, you know, the, the developer or the author and the, the reader or player. It's uh you know, there's a wide variety in the kind of setup you can have, the kind of rules you can establish. But once you establish those rules, you kind of need to stick to them. And uh, it's uh, and setting up expectations, setting up a certain pattern, and then sort of taking that deeper or, you know, turning it, you know, inverting it in an interesting way. Like that, that that's really enjoyable and satisfying, you know, for, for an audience. But, you know, you need to respect the, 
the rules other, otherwise, you know, you, you know, as in a game, you know, the player feels, you know, that something is unfair or that it wasn't set up properly or, or that it was confusing. Yeah, we can all relate to that to some extent. Of course, you were a childhood fan of comics too, right? You grew up reading. What were some of the, your favorites as a kid? I mean, Mad Magazine was oh, yeah. really my, my obsession. You know, I, I mean, I was, uh, you know, probably 10, 11 years old, you know, in, you know, just finishing elementary school, starting junior high school, when Mad Magazine and Wacky Packages kind of came along. And I, I just loved that. So I would, you know, I lived in Chappaqua, which was an hour north of New York City. And I would take the train and meet my best friend uh, who lived in Greenwich Village. And we would go to St. Mark's Place, the comic book store. We would see the double feature of movies that, you know, 10, 11 year olds should not have been allowed to see. But uh, that's another great thing about that time is like compared to today, I think we had so much freedom. Mm. You know, I think, you know, a lot of parents now wouldn't let their 10 year old take the train into, you know, into the city with Times Square. And you know, that's where the video ar arcades were, you know, when those started a few years later. But uh, mad for me was it was kind of my window into a, like an adult world that I wasn't quite old enough yet to uh, to understand. You know, the there were R-rated movies that I couldn't see in theaters, but that I, I first found out about them from reading the Mad Magazine satire, you know, you know like the you know, the Godfather, uh, uh, you know, you know, the Parallax View, all all those great movies of the seventies. Yeah, I love Mad Magazine. I was talking about I forget who I had on the show, but we were talking about Mad Magazine and the impact that it had, and like how it was able to make good the best parodies and satires of pop culture but it didn't do it like it, it wasn't like a mean thing it was like an affectionate you know it always seemed like they were coming from a good place with that and we were trying to figure you know are there any what what is the video game is there a video game equivalent of mad magazine out there somewhere you know so we were, we were trying to think of that and we really couldn't come up with anything I mean, I guess uh, some of the point and click adventure games of the 90s, you know, were parodies in a way, like, you know, the, the Curse of Monkey Island and. Uh, you know, but I don't think. I guess. <laughs> OK. Yeah, it was. Uh, no, okay. You know, another thing I was thinking of with uh, my replay, and you do touch on this, you know, throughout the uh, the novel is the the uprootedness of, of your family and a lot of people that are in the games industry, especially at the level, but you know, at your level with the AAA game development, we hear the stories about the crunch, the infamous crunch times and dislocations and things that you've worked on for years, just suddenly getting canceled and <laughs> the heartbreak uh, around all that. Uh, you know, of course, now we hear about it, all these layoffs in the industry, you know, it seems like a very tumultuous time. So maybe you could touch on that a little bit here. Yeah, I mean the, I mean the game industry. It's you know it's one part of replay, and I I didn't want to do a book that was all about game development. You know that you'd have to be a game developer to appreciate. But I wanted to show what a game developer's life is like, especially in the way that it uh, interacts with the family and with decisions like move, moving, moving across the world. You know for a project and then the, you know, the pressure when the project grows and then the, you know, the feeling when the project is canceled, which a yeah, little spoiler here, the uh, video game project that I moved to Montpellier for uh, this new Prince of Persia game uh, that we started to do in 2016 did get canceled, uh, which I sort of narrate in the book. Um, but that's uh, actually quite common as, you know, game developers know, I think, Anyone who's worked in the industry for any length of time has, you know, probably spent years on, uh, uh, maybe even as much time on projects that didn't make it to ship as the ones that did. So it's funny, our resumes kind of contain half of what we've done, and the other half is just, well, not announced or changed direction or canceled. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I wonder, is that as common? Because you're somebody that knows all the industries, <laughs> film and graphic novels and games. I mean, do you think games are unique in any way in that regard? Oh, it's, it's absolutely true, for, uh, you know, for screenwriters uh, in Hollywood. I mean, I've uh, 
for the years that I spent uh, as a screenwriter in LA, um, you know, I did, you know, I wrote many scripts, got hired, uh, got paid, you know, sold a TV show. But the only one that reached the, you know, the big screen that people might have seen is the Prince of Persia movie. Uh, from uh, Bruckheimer that came out in 2010. And there I was the first writer on the project. You know, I got the project going, but there were four other writers who came after me. So it's uh, it's not even exactly the movie I wrote. And so that's my one screenwriting credit. I've made short films, documentaries, but I've certainly spent more, you know, screenwriting hours and years on projects that uh, didn't ship. And uh, I have friends who have... Uh, uh, you know, had very, you know, long and successful careers as screenwriters, you know, who, who would say the same. Uh, so yeah, it's very, I think the, the games and the film industries are kind of, uh, you know, similar that way. One of the things about graphic novels that appeals to me, and, and I think is in a way it felt like coming full circle back to those early days of game development when I was making games on the Apple II, uh, is that if you've got paper and pen, and you're willing to do the work, you can make a graphic novel, like nobody can stop you. You can get notes and suggestions from your editor, but you're not obligated to follow them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was like that making Karateka and Prince of Persia, you know, on the Apple II in, in the 80s. It's, uh, you know, there was no budget, really, apart from, you know, me paying my rent and, you know, ordering pizza or wanting to buy a new uh, disk drive, things like that. There was, uh, you know, teams are very small, often like people would contribute to the games, uh, you know, of their friends, just, you know, out of solidarity or for free, you know, for Prince of Persia, my brother was the first uh, rotoscope animation model, my dad composed the music, and my colleagues, you know, who were working on their own projects at Broderbund, uh, like Veda Cook and Tommy Pierce, you know, as I, you know, narrate in, uh, in replay, uh, it had some of the key ideas that Prince of Persia players, you know, have enjoyed, like uh, the shadow man, the jump through the mirror, uh, the little white mouse. Uh, so, um, but... I think, uh, you know, as an indie game developer today, or you know, as a you know old school game developer in the eighties, we uh, as developers we have the, the power that a graphic novelist has. To just do it you don't have to, you don't need funding you don't need permission if you believe in the thing that you're doing you can just do it but that's obviously not the situation for you know a triple a game or a big budget hollywood movie where somebody you know publisher or studio has to put in hundreds of millions of dollars you know to make this happen and to keep it greenlit and you know take it all the way to release yeah it's always amazing to me to, to look at some of the old older games from the 80s and you know credits might be one name or a couple of names <laughs> and then you watch the prince of persia the movie and it goes on for you know 10 minutes of all these people that worked on it oh yeah so that's it's really a you know i never thought about that before but so the graph you like the graphic novel format because you have a lot more control it's a lot more you uh in that so is that why you chose to do replay as a graphic novel as opposed to i mean you could do any format i suppose you wanted to I mean, that's one reason, but I, I think, you know, I've, I've worked in so many different media over the years and I, I love them all. You know, I love games, I love movies and, and graphic novels. Um, and also in the graphic novels, I have sometimes I've worked as a writer with another artist, you know, with an illustrator who draws it. And my role is just to contribute the script as if I were the screenwriter on a movie. In replay, for the first time, I drew pages as well as writing them. And this was, in a way, it was like a very new challenge for me. And, uh, you know, the, uh, this is my, the first, first time graphic you drew. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> this is your first time? Not counting uh, the comics that I drew up until age 12, you know, oh, when, wow. okay. when the Apple II came along. But I, so I had a basis, you know, but, but I sort of stopped so young that when I picked it up again after a break of 30 years, you know, I still drew like a 12 year old. You know, if you look at the sketches that I did for Karateka and Prince of Persia and The Last Express, you know, during the making of those games, uh, some of which you can see in my published uh, journals, you know, the making of Prince of Persia, I published my journals from the time. Yeah. And uh, in the illustrated versions, I, uh, 
you know, also included some of the sketches, pencil sketches that I did. But those were, were that wasn't artwork that was meant to be uh, become part of the game. You know, I wasn't creating art assets. You know, I was. Uh, Well, sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, actually, okay. In that case, I was. You just showed the traced uh, rotoscope figures for Karateko, where I actually traced the Super 8 film frames of, uh, you know, the model punching and kicking, which created the animation for the game. So, okay, uh, to be, I did create the art assets for those games, but this was also this was pixel art. These were characters that were 40 pixels high in the backgrounds. But as far as drawing, uh you know, a piece of art that would exist on paper, you know, in its final form and was meant to look good. I didn't really do that. You know, my storyboards were just communication tools for the team. I would do a quick scribble storyboard of a sequence just to show, you know, what I had in mind, where the camera angle should go, but that it was functional artwork. It wasn't meant to exist on its own. So drawing a, a graphic novel is different because, you know, the, like what you draw is what the reader is going to see. So it's really using, you know, art drawing as a direct uh, communication uh, medium with with the final audience, and that's, I think that's another reason that I wanted to do it for replay. It's I think it's more personal, it's more intimate, and it's, uh, you know, just like writing using words to communicate is something that's very personal. And you know, when you write a book or when you talk, you're, you know, you're sharing, you know, and you're exchanging with someone. When you draw, you know, that, that's also uh, a kind of communication. It's a mode of expression. And it's a mode of expression that was important to me when I was a kid. Even when I was, you know, four or five years old, you know, I would use pencil or crayons and, or markers and I would, I would draw. And that, that was sort of my way of making my little mark on the world, you know, as a little kid. You know, later, you know, I got excited about doing that with video games and creating a game that people could play and enjoy. But there were all sort of, ways of storytelling, ways of communicating, ways of kind of trying to create an experience for the ultimate audience. And so to do that in the graphic novel form, I think it, it's something that, you know, it just felt right. And it felt right to do it for replay because it was such a personal story. And I'm writing about myself and about members of my family. It would have felt uh, very different, I think, to, for example, to write it as a script and then give it to a director who would then cast actors to play the roles of all of these people I know so well, or even to ask another artist, you know, as I did with my other graphic novels, Templar, Monte Cristo and Liberty to draw what mm -hmm. I had written in the script, you know, what they would draw might be great, but it wouldn't be what I had in my head because I'm the one who lived through these, uh, uh, these things, you know, in the case of my, you know, Apple II and, and my family experiences. And then, you know, in the case, you know, for, for the part of the story that my dad and my grandfather told me, I mean, I can look at photographs, uh, you know, and, you know, in their photo albums, I can read, you know, I can interview them, but I also know them, you know, I know how they talk, how they move, how they gesture. And so when I draw my dad, you know, at, at whatever age uh, in replay, it's like, I'm, I'm not, it's not an actor playing him in a way, like for me, it's him. Yeah, it sounds like you had a, you know, really fulfilling experience writing this. It's funny. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, it was cathartic in a way, but I, I, for the three years it took me to write and draw this book, I was, uh, I was just happy to get up every morning and go to the atelier and draw more panels and more pages. You know, each chapter, each sequence was kind of like a new adventure. It was revisiting like a different part of, you know, my past or my dad's past or, uh, even things like drawing the game development of Prince of Persia was kind of was kind of a little pleasure to revisit the Apple II and revisit those days. Yeah, there's Mad Magazine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there, there's a uh, on the cover that's uh, Stanley Kubrick's film, uh, A Clockwork Orange. You know, the Mad Magazine version, uh, which <laughs> yeah, I read like, of course, I uh, I would never that's have been able probably to. not appropriate for kids there. <laughs> Definitely not, but. Uh, but yeah, I, I love putting those little Easter eggs into uh, into replay as a graphic novel. You know, just the titles of, you know, the posters on the wall. There's the butterflies uh, from yeah, that plays a role in. The... Yeah, and and, and that, that's real. You know, there, there were our house was full of uh, framed butterflies because that was my dad's hobby, uh, which you know he got from his father. It sort of came from the old country. It's a very very Austrian 
hobby to catch butterflies and frame them. So, uh, you know, just kind of remembering those things and then drawing them. Something I enjoyed. The, the, there's my brother with me on the couch, by the way, the, the same brother who modeled the Prince of Persia animation uh, a few years later. Yeah, that's you know like you can really zero in on these drawings. I, you know, even though I've read this once, I feel like I need to reread, <laughs> replay just to notice all the little things that you might not be paying attention to the first time you read it, but once you know that it, oh, there's the butterflies and, you know, of course, the piano, <laughs> music, the movies. Yeah, and notice just a little detail, but I used sepia uh, for the balloon. Uh, where they're singing this uh, song, this Schubert song in German. Oh. I use the old German lettering because just to kind of suggest subliminally that the singing this song in German, it's like, you know, it, for them, it's reconnecting with their past, with the old country. It's, uh, you know, the reader doesn't need to notice that that one little bit of this page is in sepia, but I think in the, reading the book, you kind of feel it. And it uh, yeah. just in some places it just adds another layer. This brilliant stuff. I mean, yeah, I don't even know if I noticed that the first time. Probably not. So. You pointed out, I'm like, yeah, okay, that makes that makes sense. <laughs> it's a good example too of the sort of uniqueness of the graphic novel or comics format sort of thing you can do. I don't know what the equivalent of this would be in another another medium. You, you know, there, there are things that you can do in graphic novels that really have no equivalent. It, it's a uh, you know, as a visual storytelling form, just as with games, you know, games are interactive, like films, TV, uh, graphic novels don't have interactivity in that way. So that there are effects that you can experience as a player playing a game that really have no equivalent. Uh, you know, th things like, uh, you know, in Prince of Persia, the moment when, uh, you know, the princess steals your dagger that you've been using to rewind time. It's not just like in... In a movie, okay, if, if uh, you know a character stole the dagger and, and then the protagonist had to go and get it back, you know, you would feel suspense and all of that. But as a player, it now means that you can't rewind. You have to play through this next level, climbing, you know, the Tower of Dawn with, you know, with this dagger that you've come to rely on taken away from you. So it's that much harder. Mm. Yeah, so, so the gameplay yeah, mechanics like, affecting the narrative and the. Directly. I mean, it's one small example. We could come up with thousands, but, you know, interactivity is actually part of the storytelling in games. And in graphic novels, you know, the layout on the page is part of the visual storytelling. And you don't have that in a movie. You know, every image takes over the screen. The editing of the movie sets the rhythm at which the audience will experience the movie. And it's the same for every audience. You know, whether you're watching the movie on your TV at home or in a large theater, you know, that's full of people or a large theater with just a few people, the movie unfolds in, at exactly the same pace. And the soundtrack is exactly the same. On a graphic novel, you can, you know, you have, you present the reader with a, a two page spread and the reader's eye will travel over those two pages in their own way. Some people read very fast reading the words and then they go back and read the book a second time and really spend time looking at the images. Some people, read slowly from the beginning because they want to appreciate every page of artwork and it takes them three or four times longer to read the book in yeah, that computer. You, you can turn a few pages back or 30 pages back to compare the page that you're on with an earlier page. You can reread, you can skip, and, and you can decide what part of the page your eye is going to linger on. And, and, uh, that, and also you can, as the storyteller in a graphic novel, you can go from a very intimate, you know, in person moment to a map mm. just jump out further back than a movie camera could and in the next panel you can be in a different place in a movie you can do that with editing but it's uh you, you know you have to be very careful about how you do it so that it's not dislocating you have to think about the rhythm of the movie graphic novels are really I mean, just given incredible freedom to do that and it's you know it's not jarring at all to you know, to be reading a page and then you suddenly see a map of the world showing where you are or, you know, illustrating what the characters are talking about and it just flows. Yeah, even the, like the size of the panels and... Yeah. Yeah, really strike, striking. I know that sometimes it would have a, a sort of a feel to it when you'd go from... Because most of the page is a lot of panels, I guess six panels or so, but then occasionally you get to a full page 
<laughs> and that always has an when I'm reading this, I, I'm a very slow graphic novel reader, like you were talking about before, because <laughs> uh, I don't want to just read the text. You know, I want to look at very carefully at the pictures and see what's all happening there. Yeah. yeah, here's your tips for game developers on this. So there is some stuff. <laughs> There's plenty of stuff here for game developers. <laughs> yeah, and this is another thing that you can do in a graphic novel. You can sort of take a like here, and I think this is chapter two. You know, I sort of take a beat to just kind of explain how the game industry has changed mm -hmm. and and i included my 10 tips uh which uh you know have kind of been evolving over the last 20 years uh and i you put them on fun about if you have a chance to move to another country to work on a game you should do it. <laughs> am i making that was one of your rules at some point right uh yeah i mean that that was uh yeah further on I, oh it comes up later and much later in the book i have a conversation with, with my friend tommy who's you know, been advising me all the way. And I'm, at, you know, I just drew a panel where I'm actually coming up with these 10 tips in response to a question by a journalist. This is, you know, in 2004, around the time that Sands of Time has shipped, you know, a magazine asked me for 10 tips. And uh, I'm, I come up with number 11. Yeah, if you have a chance to move to another country uh, for, for a video game project, uh, do it because that had worked out so well for me, uh, going to Montreal to do the Sands of Time with Ubisoft. And Tommy says, uh, now 10 tips, not 11. So that number 11 didn't make it. Yeah, she was uh, inst instrumental in a lot of ways, especially with Last Express. Yeah, Tommy was my co-writer uh, for The Last Express. You know, the game w wouldn't have existed without her. Now, what a great game that is. I mean, we have so many things we could talk about, but just... You know, people's you love trains too, right? Just in general, are you a, a train fan? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, there are some real serious train fans uh, yeah. in the world. So I can't claim to be a, a true train fan, but I've always liked trains. I've always preferred taking the train to taking the plane. Mm. And um, for a lot of reasons, I like to I like to see the countryside going by. You know, I can look out the window at any time. It's uh, you can move or you can get up and walk around in a train, you know. And when you go to a train station, you basically just walk in, you sit down on the train. It takes however many hours and then you get off at the end. And often in Europe, you're in the center of town. Like mm. where, where we live now, I can walk to the train station from home. And, you, you know, in most towns, you know, to go to the airport requires, you know, it can take an hour to get out there to the airport. And then you have to go through security. You have to wait. So a one hour plane flight is for me is kind of the equivalent of a four or even five hour plane flight i'm oh, sorry train ride you know in terms of the amount of time that you can actually just you know relax and work or read or you know enjoy it so yeah so i like trains but it the last express is uh you know it's a story that uses the uh the setting of a train you know th that game you know the whole design of the game is based on the the fact that you're in the contained environment of, uh, you know, the Orient Express train cars, uh, and, and the other characters are going to be the passengers and crew of the train, and at the same time, it's an environment that's moving, so that you start out the game in Paris, mm -hmm. and end up in uh, Constantinople, and in the three days and nights that it takes the train to cross Europe, World War One breaks out. So that's uh, so it's a kind of a moving. Uh, contained environment, which for a point and click adventure game and the technology that we had in 1993 uh, was really just a perfect setting. And the train is also a metaphor for Europe because it has all of the nationalities, you know, the characters kind of represent all of the different factions and levels of society of this, uh, you know, early 20th century European world that was just about to go to war and, and be destroyed. So all, all of those reasons kind of got me you know, excited about the idea of doing a game set on a train. And so the research that uh, we then did, you know, to be able to represent that train accurately, that was kind of done specifically for the game. But then, of course, since then, I've I've really developed an appreciation for the incredible work that train enthusiasts and archivists and historians do just to, to preserve these details. Oh, I mean, you said in the beginning of the podcast that, you know, it's about history preservation Mm. So, so, and you know, there's no better example than the uh, 
you know, that moment in 1993 when we were just starting to make The Last Express and, you know, wanted to represent that train, that 1914 Orient Express uh, accurately. And we sort of hit a wall, you know, the, the company, the Wagon Lee, the, the Orient Express company didn't have any of the records. And they actually said, you know, sorry, we, we had to toss all that stuff, you know, about 10 years ago because we, you know, we just didn't have the space to keep it all. Uh, and so we were kind of, uh, you know, we thought we weren't going to get, and then, but we placed an ad in a train enthusiasts magazine in France, you know, a little classified ad uh, saying, looking for, you know, Orient, 1914 Orient Express enthusiasts and with a phone number. And one day the phone rang and it was uh, these, you know, these two elderly gentlemen, you know, and they, so it was almost like a spy novel moment you know they gave us a rendezvous uh, they said go to the train station the Gare de l'Est and uh, at the end you know behind uh, track number one there's a, a door that says no admittance you know go into that door and go down a flight of stairs and we'll be waiting for you oh, wow. I there. and of course it's a it's a club of retired railway employees uh, from the SNCF and you know these guys who had spent all their lives you know working for the you know for the railroad you know for the French train company now that they were retired, they had this club in the basement of Gare de l'Est where they had this the biggest model train set that I had ever seen. And, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, memorabilia and so And so we told them, you know, told them what we were looking for. They took notes. And, uh, and we said, yeah, and, you know, the, you know, the bag only told us that they had destroyed these archives. And they said, uh, oh, they think they destroyed them. Oh, we took them home. Oh, how awesome! In fact, they had been keeping these boxes of uh, you know Xerox copies of these old manuals in their house, and so the next uh, uh, the next week we met them again, and they had brought you know the floor plans, the train timetables, the conductor's manual, everything we needed to make uh, the Last Express authentic. And really, if we had done this project ten years later, they wouldn't have been there anymore. And those you know those things that they had saved, I think they were they took them home out of a kind of an instinct that this was history, that this was worth saving, but nobody ever asked them for it. And then for the crazy reason, you know, some Americans, you know, wanting to make a video game, a computer game set on a train. What, what even is that? You know, in 1993, we, uh, we asked them for it and they shared what they had. And thanks to that, we were able to reproduce the Orient Express, you know, with, you know, as a 3d model with all the, you know, with all the textures and the proportions. So that playing the game, you can kind of, you know, get a feeling of what it was like to ride that train in 1914, you know, as you would, you know, had it been done for a movie. Yeah, and we've been talking about preserving video game history, but this is video games preserving, you know, actual history. <laughs> I mean, I mean, what, how, you probably couldn't get closer to the experience than, than playing this. Yeah, this is, yeah, one of my good friends, colleagues, who's a really loves video games happens to be a big model train fan probably about equal <laughs> so, you know i ever ask what's your favorite game it's always last express you know do you even <laughs> ask i mean i like trains <laughs> yeah it's it's great that's great to hear it's i'm so happy that the game is kind of having its uh second or even third life now uh, uh because uh dot mu uh, re-released it about 10 years ago on mobile so for for android and uh, iphone uh, with a you know the point and click interface adapted to a touch screen and uh, you can also play it on uh, gog.com you know the original pc game uh, it's uh i mean it's wonderful and, and surprising to me that the uh you know the retro gaming community is you know it's if anything it's growing you know these games that i think in the 80s and 90s we kind of assumed that they'll be around for a few years and then the machines to play them won't be around anymore on the contrary, those machines are around. People are collecting them and, uh, mm. you know, cherishing them, you know, selling the original games and trading them, you know, on eBay. And then on, under emulation, you know, thanks to the Internet Archive and, you know, other, you know, services that are making these games, that are preserving the games and making them available, you can play, you know, the 1990 PC Prince of Persia, uh, you know, in your browser or under emulation. And, and all, all of these games are... You know, I think they're going to be around now for a while. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And I was thinking of, 
I'll do a little bit of uh, I like film history as well. Yes, I said I was uh, trying to think all oh, the stuff Jordan Mechner's worked on. You know, so of course you watch The Prince of Persia, but then you want to watch some of the older movies that kind of inspired that or were kind of in the milieu, like Thief of Baghdad and all these these other movies. But you you, you find these stories about movies that they come out in the theater. They don't maybe they don't bomb, but they're not really they don't do too well for various reasons. But then later uh, they pick up on VHS or you know uh, dvd or whatever and then of course they get on netflix and you get all these people that are just discovering it for the first time you know 20 30 years later <laughs> yeah it's so satisfying especially you know you know as a kid or in your 20s to come across a movie that you've never heard of yeah like thief of Baghdad. i never watched that yeah. before oh <laughs> like yeah i see it you know i can see the you know the the influences there with the you know the kid climbing up all, all over the walls and stuff it's very video game, and that was what 60s, oh, uh, the 1940 40s. Oh, wow, even more, yeah, yeah. With the one with Sabu and Conrad Veidt, yeah, yeah, that one, yeah. yeah he, if you've or, seen the movie uh, Casablanca, you know, he played the, the villain Major Strasser, oh. and in Thief of Baghdad, uh, which is a uh, Technicolor, uh, you know, in English film, he plays the grant, the evil vizier Jafar, uh, which of course is the name of the evil vizier in Prince of Persia. And in a strange coincidence, it's also the name of the evil vizier in Aladdin, which came out four years after Prince of Persia. So I, I think the, yeah. you know, the Disney filmmakers, uh, you know, who made the animated movie Aladdin had also seen this, this great 1940 film as I had. Yeah, this is a great film. I'm glad I watched this. This is kind of early for, was this early for color? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's uh I know this, the special effects I thought were really cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow, I kept having to, like, how, when was this man? Could it have been that early? <laughs> it was just, I mean, they yeah, were amazing. And you think they didn't have computers and things like that to do this special well, effect. E even when they made Star Wars, uh, you know, 36 years later, it, that was still done with film and with in camera special effects. You know, no nothing was digital yet. And of course, in 1940, you know, Technicolor was pretty new. Uh, by the way, The Wizard of Oz uh, and S Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, also in Technicolor, came out, I think, a, a year or two earlier, you know, also in color. It's funny, we were talking about my dad, and th this was, um, this is just sort of one of those, like, it's, it's fun, like, timelines lining up in ways that we don't think about, but my dad saw Snow White on the big screen, the first movie that he'd ever seen in a movie theater. I think he was seven years or eight years old. He saw it in Paris just after having fled Vienna, you know, after, after the Anschluss. He saw this, you know, movie as a refugee. And then, of course, that was the last movie he saw for a long time, uh, spending the next uh, three years on the run from the Gestapo. But, th but this connection between my dad's story you know, and this strong memory that he had of seeing Snow White in a movie theater and then the influence that Snow White had on me, you know, in my own childhood, you know, you know, 30, 40 years later uh, and being interested in animation, Disney animation, rotoscoping, and then using those techniques to make a video game kind of uh, uh, when I, you know, realizing that felt to me like closing a loop. Walt Disney. Yeah. You, can, you can see in, in this uh, picture that the, the dwarves are drawn. Uh, and Snow White is rotoscoped. I mean, they actually costumed an actress as Snow White, filmed her doing the moves, and then the animators, uh, you know, sort of traced over those frames, rotoscoped them to, to make her more uh, lifelike, more realistic, you know, than the dwarves who are very cartoony. Maybe we should. I don't know if people know what rotoscoping <laughs> it's Maybe. Yeah. I mean, maybe... very simply, rotoscoping is just filming live action. Right. And then using that live action film as a reference for animation, basically taking it frame by frame and tracing or, you know, adapting each frame uh, to to uh, create the animation. By the way, that's rotoscoping uh, in the sense that animators use it. There's also a, a different kind of rotoscoping that's used in special effects, but that, that's it's the same word that describes two different processes. Yeah, this is the one I was always think about is I don't know if you if they show the uh, the rotoscoping in this, oops, 
Yeah, Gulliver's Travels. Doesn't this have rotoscoping? Um, or maybe I'm. Could be. Let's see. It, it, maybe maybe for the main character, if I could find him. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That 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 looks to me like. Uh, yeah, those hands look to me like they were rotoscoped. I just remember watching this for whatever reason. I don't know if we had a copy of it. <laughs> you know, when you, uh, you know, my family was always, what, what can we do to calm the kids down? Let's put in this cartoon movie. So as I was watching this, I'm like, there's a, Gulliver looks different, you know, and the same thing with Snow White. Like, she looks different than the other uh, characters in this, and it's that rotoscoping uh, technique. Of course, you use that in your video game, a uh, career to great effect. And yeah, the Last Express also used rotoscoping, but there all the characters were rotoscoped. And, and the purpose there was a little different from Karateka and Prince of Persia, where the rotoscoping was for the, you know, running, jumping, fighting, you know, action, you know, sprites, scene full figure. And Last Express, we really also had close-ups. You know, when you see a character walk down the train corridor and like pass the camera and for a moment, you know, that glance, you know, the way that you sort of exchange a glance or expression when you pass somebody in a narrow corridor wanted to capture that moment, which you feel uh, so often on a train. And there, you know, the subtleties in that expression of a live actor, you know, are wonderful. And with rotoscoping, we could actually capture that, you know, the little lift of an eyebrow comes across. Yeah, but it didn't look like full motion video. Uh, you mentioned Scott McCloud, mm. you know, who pointed out in his uh, wonderful book, uh, Understanding Comics, that the more realistic a drawing is, the more it sort of puts us at a distance, you know, the ultimate, of course, being a photograph. Mm. And then he ha has a page where there's a series of comic drawings uh, going from a photograph, like more and more cartoony and ending up with just a kind of the universal symbol of a smiley face, you know, a circle with two dots mm. and the curve for the smile and points out that each one is more universal and more easy to kind of project yourself into than the last. So I thought that for a video game, because, you know, you want the illusion of interactivity, the illusion that what we do, you know, with the, the interface you know, as the player is actually changing the behavior of the, you know, the, the characters on the, the sprites on the screen. If the sprites look like full motion video, I think in our subconscious, we know, okay, an actor did this on the set, it was filmed, therefore nothing that I do can change that performance. But when it's uh, a cartoon, you know, as, as you know, with, you know, a video game like Mario, you know, it's, okay, he's cartoon, he's going to do what I, what I do with the controller. If I say jump, he's going to jump. That's me up there. You can feel that that's me up there jumping. I'm not watching a filmed actor jumping, I'm jumping. And with The Last Express, I hope that the rotoscoping would create a kind of a in-between, a feeling that we're looking at something that it might have been filmed or it might have just been hand-drawn uh, using pen and ink by an by an animator, it kind of has that cartoon or graphic novel look. Mm -hmm. And that just that question would allow the players to suspend disbelief and imagine that, uh, yeah, these characters could do completely different things, you know, based on how I behave in the game. Yeah, that's just, that's just fascinating. Yeah, so really rotoscoping is something that might always have a use. You know, I've had uh, voice actors and lot, you know, people that worked on full motion video games you know, on the show. And this is this topic comes up a lot. Well, you know, why not just make everything sprite based or whatever? And they're like, well, there's no way it could capture the, you know, a professional actor, whether it's voice or, you know, live actor, all of these subtle things like with the face or with the voice, uh, they can't be replicated, at least in a convincing, even when they try, you know, <laughs> they really try to get the best resolution, whatever all the 3D, you know, what have you. It's actually off-putting in those cases. It's, it's like a funny paradox that the the sometimes... Valley type thing kicks yes, in. Yes. Sometimes the more realistic and high resolution something gets, the more we just see the flaws. You know, the, the, like the brain is really amazing. We can do a sketch with a few lines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when Picasso draws a dove, you know, it's a dove, it's emotional, it's graphic. Uh, but... Uh, you know, somehow our brain fills in everything that's not there. And the more is filled in, the more our brain starts to kind of complain a bit and say, well, you know, this little bit over here, the shading is not quite accurate. Uh, so, mm. yeah. I think a lot of Karataka and Prince of Persia, the first time you move, 
<laughs> your character oh whoa this is okay this is different <laughs> you know it is kind of tripping those a lot of those boundaries now, i wanted to mention uh the uh digital eclipse thing i had these ian and uh steven on not too long ago to talk about this one yeah this was fantastic yeah the digital eclipse uh interactive the interviews documents. and they they show like the how the rotoscoping worked you know to really take you through that and even let you play the different prototypes <laughs> this was this must have been great did you have a good time making this well i i didn't make i mean you i didn't, didn't make it, you did 40 it. years ago but but you know it was i mean i honestly i was amazed you know when digital eclipse approached me and you know said they wanted to do this project and i said great wonderful go ahead i mean i thought it was going to be you know karateka playable again you know under emulation on modern consoles i didn't realize how far they were going to go to really make a i don't know how to describe it it's interactive playable documentary is kind of the phrase you know the yeah. the closest i can come but it's uh it, to me it's like an interactive museum exhibit it's like spending a like somehow a museum has an entire wing devoted to the making of karateka and to what i was doing you know between junior high school and uh you know the end of uh, college when karateka shipped and they've it's like you can sort of walk through the the exhibit and decide what to look at how long to look at it i mean any of these you know this uh, this interview uh, here where my dad and I uh, sort of interview each other about making the music for Karateka. And then he, you know, and he plays some of it on the piano, but then they've also got the sheet music. You can look at the sheet music. They've got a podcast mm -hmm. where a, you know, a musicologist like just talks about the music for Karateka and compares it to the music in other games and kind of its place in video game music history. That's just one little thing. Then there's a, you know, the rotoscope, there's an interactive rotoscope theater where you can actually go in and play with it and like, look at the frames on all the different layers. And uh, so each of these things is something like, uh, to me, it's like the experience of walking through a museum exhibit and you can just walk through the room very quickly and maybe come back to it later, or you can really stop at one exhibit and go hands-on and just spend 20 minutes with it. So that it's they they really put incredible depth and, and the labor of love into this uh, project. You know, when I was talking to him, I said, "You guys are basically doing understanding comics <laughs> uh, for video games." And they're like, "Oh yeah!" And now that you mention it, that <laughs> we're very flattered. <laughs> but I love it. You know, I was thinking, I was telling those those guys, I think this would be great for video game studies courses. They're popping up in colleges and things because you know I don't think you can get it just by reading it. There's something it's so nice you can have people play it, you can have people read about it, but this is like both things kind of yeah. You know, it's really leveraging the the medium in really clever ways. I think it's 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 the right way to do video game history because uh you know, and sometimes I talk to you know to groups of you know of students, young people, you know, aspiring game designers, you know, at universities and so forth. And you know, so talking about games, you know, from the eighties, you know, or nineties, you know, from before they were born, it's like they're interested, but describing things only goes so far. And and if they go online and find the game and play it, that also, it's, uh, it doesn't really do it because, at you know the age that we were, the state of the technology at that time, you know our imagination filled in the blanks. I mean, you know, you know people's memories of playing Karateka, you know, when they, you know, people who were five or six or eight years old when they played Karateka you know, or Prince of Persia for the first time, you know, in their minds, it's like they were living and playing an adventure. They were running and jumping and fighting. And, you know, that was real music and those were real sound effects. Uh, it's, you know, just as when we read a graphic novel or a novel, you know, we bring more than half of the experience uh, to it from our own imagination. And I think because we're kind of as the player or the reader, because we're co-creators of that experience, it, it becomes even stronger and our memories, uh, you know, last longer. And then as adults, we remember that childhood encounter and, uh, you know, these are important memories. It, it's, uh, you know, and, but today, of course, players, you know, young players are used to things that are just completely, you know, photorealistic or hyper-realistic, the sound effects, the music, you know, and 
you know, that's in a way that there's less for the imagination to bring compared to when you're, you know, looking at a character that's a few pixels high and you're hearing these beeps and buzzes and you're imagining that you're trapped in a dungeon. You know, so I, I think to for today's young players to really assimilate, you know, those early years of game development, like in, in a way that can be useful to them, you know, and kind of inspiring them and, you know, maybe giving ideas for where, you know, where their generation will take the field next. I think it's great to have something like what Digital Eclipse has done, which gives them the context. You know, the I think without without the context, without other people, you know, sort of without the interviews and without the, you know, the work materials and the, you know, even the journal excerpts that uh, sort of put the game into context, you know, it's sort of hard to just look at a, mm. you know, a 19... 82 prototype in isolation in 2024 and to really feel much of anything but bringing it all together you know, and of course making it playable you know yeah. because it's you know these are games i think uh yeah it's a great way to do it yeah i noticed i've, I've teach a few game studies courses and you know one of the challenges i think is to make people <laughs> more appreciative <laughs> you know so they say oh that's an old game you know what's you know, I imagine like somebody over in film studies showing Steamboat Willie, you know, and trying to say, look, this is a masterpiece. <laughs> Let me show you why you, uh, need, you might need some context, you know, to fully appreciate what you're looking at here. You know, I guess it's not different than a, like a music course somebody might take where they're, yeah, Beethoven, <laughs> uh, Mozart, let's talk about this, you know, There's I mean, yeah, you need to know. I, it's funny. It's one thing like, I, I can understand, like a music student kind of being like, yeah, you know, 18th century music, Mozart, Beethoven, you know, it's it's not really uh, not my personal taste, but I'll study it because it's in the course. But I've, you know, friends who teach film, who teach screenwriting and so forth. And sometimes they say, you know, I, say, you know, I just did the class, you know, we, I was talking about Star Wars and one of the students said, yeah, I'm just not so into old movies. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah i guess that's right star wars oh no you know, is, no thank you know 1970s it's uh you, you probably met george lucas i i did i did I, I i was uh and i remember the day i was 18 years old no no i'm sorry i was uh i, I was 21 and, and this was, uh, I was at Broderbund and uh, the Skywalker Ranch was right up the road. And so I'd gone up there to meet with them and sort of, you know, I think they'd seen Karateka. And so they wanted to talk to me about, oh, you, know, wow. you know, bringing storytelling to their, uh, you know, because I thought, I think, I think they hadn't yet started up, uh, you know, LucasArts but they had the idea of you know, doing something with video games. So, you know, I, I didn't do it, you know, I had that, that meeting and, you know, then I went back to working on Prince of Persia at Broderbund. But for me as a, you know, having been 12 years old when Star Wars came out and then, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, having been first in line to see Return of the Jedi, you know. Yeah, you talk about that in one of the earlier. Yeah. Those yeah, one of these I remember you were talking about seeing Return of the. You know, that's another thing I love about. I don't want to get off topic here, but one yeah. thing I love about these journals is you talk about, oh, I went to see the Return of the Jedi, or I went to see this, and you get to see like all the pop culture stuff that's happening all around you, and you know some of the some of your reactions are just as fun, <laughs> you know, about movies and things, and I'm like yeah, I could I could see why some because I, you know, I was a really little kid when I watched Return of the Jedi in the theater, uh, so I don't know. I had to think back, like what was my experience. I remember coming out of the theater and just, you know, oh, it was the best movie. You know, my dad watched it with me. He's like, yeah, but I didn't like the Ewoks. <laughs> I think it was, is, is uh, I don't, I don't quite remember. What, what was your reaction? You might have to. I think I was, I was so hyped up, yeah. you know, the movie and so excited for it that, uh, Empire. uh, and I, and I saw it with a group of friends who were just as passionate. So I think for about 12 hours after the movie, it's like, we were just still on that cloud. Like, Oh, that was great. That was, and then, I sort of thought about it and realized that it sucked and that I was so disappointed. And then the more I thought about it, the less I liked it. And, uh, 
and so that you know the but the first star wars movie the first two star wars movies had been good but then they they lost they lost the they yeah. lost the plot a great, a great line i'm trying to remember what it was something about princess lee is the unkissable on solos it's this and not, i forget i wish i could remember the the quote because it's really oh, right, right. I, I wrote a little review of it in my journal yeah, it was really i thought clever uh, you, you remember what it was <laughs> yeah. yeah i think i said something like that you know that they that the characters were there were archetypes you know they, they weren't you know they were sort of cardboard characters you know the each of them had like one or two or three attributes that defined them and then the character evolution that happened in the trilogy was that they you know they lost those attributes like uh you know han became responsible uh you know leia fell in love darth vader stopped being evil <laughs> you know and L luke became mature and, and so they lost the sort of the attributes that had made them engaging as characters in the first movie but there wasn't really enough depth for those transitions to have meaning something like that yeah, i mean coming from the, you know a very wise uh you know <laughs> 19 year old or 18 year old uh, movie critic uh, i was i mean you were the perfect audience for it really i mean yeah. I, mean, I love those parts of the the book or these uh the journals we talked about an hour here <laughs> you have time for maybe one or two more you I don't know if you have to run. Oh, um, yeah, we we can go a little over an hour. That's it. Okay, well, I got a bunch of questions that people sent in. Let me see if I could find a good one. Uh, da -da. No, this one you. This is a big. Let me do a quick one. So they were wondering about. Have you seen Ralph uh, Bakshi's? I think I don't know if you pronounce how you pronounce his name. Yeah. A S H I. Uh, Ralph Bakshi. Uh, yeah. Lord of the Rings, Fire and Ice, I think. So yeah, we, yes. We I saw that was in the Fire. 70s, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I remember, I see, I have a vague memory of seeing that in a movie theater uh, around that time, maybe late 70s. Uh, and yeah, it was rotoscoped and I noticed it. There was, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the orcs, the crowds of orcs, you know, it's kind of the, you know, these, you know, sort of, you know, with a lot, with a lot of black you know, mm. silhouettes. Uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah. I love those movies. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't say they're, they're very different than the Peter Jackson ones, of course, you know, but I, I still like them. My, my, my main memory of uh, seeing the, the Lord of the Rings movie uh, as a kid, apart from the, the rotoscoped orcs battle, was, you know, having read the book and loved the book, I was like, how are they going to fit this into a movie? And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, Okay, we're an hour in, and we've only gotten this far. Like, how how is this going to work? And uh, and then of course, at the end, after about an hour and a half, it ends and says, "This is the end of part one of the Lord of the Rings." I'm like, "What? He didn't say it was just part one." Yeah, I wonder how many parts he wanted to make. Yeah, at least three. Okay, we touched on this one a little bit already, uh, but thinking about replay. Uh, what connection between your life and your father and your grandfather's life shocked you the most? Well, I, I think the one that surprised me the most is in replay. And I put the surprise in replay and it comes as a surprise when you read the book. So I think I'd better not, you know, better not <laughs> read the know, book, <laughs> explain that one with a spoiler. But, uh, but, but, you know, there were, there were many, you know, smaller things. You know, I mentioned the fact that, you know, my, my dad's experience as a refugee in occupied France and mine as a game developer in France today, for some reason, we're both drawn to towns on the seaside. And that was something that it just never occurred to me. Hmm. And, you know, my dad he said, yeah, you know, then in, you know, 19, you know, 39, we went to Le Touquet uh, and my aunt had a job working in a tobacco shop and the, you know, the pilots were, uh, you know the customers were Luftwaffe pilots, and uh, so I sort of, but I didn't quite picture it. And it was only when I was drawing these panels and I was, wait a minute, it, it's it's a beach. I'm, I'm no matter where I are in which timeline, I'm drawing a beach in France. You know, yeah. there's the ocean and there's the seagulls, and then, then of course I had to travel to those towns to to really see how the 
in the specific atmosphere, the specific beaches of those towns were different. I mean, that, that was one, but there, you know, there are so many others, but my dad's stamp collecting hobby hmm. that he shared with his cousin, you know, in Nice, I, I, that's exactly the kind of nerdy pursuit that, uh, you know, I, like knowing my dad now, I mean, he's a chess master, you know, he's, uh, and then of course, myself, you know, getting into, you know, D and D and tabletop games and computer games. It's, you know, it's like stamp collecting was almost like the, you know, the, the equivalent, you know, of its time in 1940. So the, the you know, the, the role that these hobbies, that these passions kind of play wherever you are. And, and also the, the way that even in that incredibly dangerous, mm. you know, sad situation of being you know, a kid separated from his parents and from his baby sister for years, you know, being in danger in, you know, in, in France and under the Pétain government, uh, you know, with all of the, you know, with everything that was the sort of the, the, the kind of the ax that was hanging over their heads every day, but they could still enjoy things like a, you know, a meal together and, you know, sharing their stamp collections. Uh, it kind of helped me to project myself into that into yeah. that time and place and, and to feel like, you know, we're, we're the same people. It's the same, you know, I, it wasn't, it, it's the same things, the same themes just re recurring and kind of in different forms. I think that's one of the most, maybe one of the things that makes it so powerful is that we, we think we got this idea of what it was like, uh, but reading this and some of the everyday things that are happening, then like, well, I, never, I never would have imagined. Yeah. I mean, that's the great. That, that happening and, you know, the, you know, when the officers are coming in to the uh, tobacco shop and trying to drop these hints, you know, <laughs> it's like, wow, I never, this is, a, you know, I never would have thought about that. You know, that's the great thing about doing something that's true, you know, that's based on somebody's, you know, recollection is that it, there are things that you would not invent. Mm. And, yeah. you, know, you, may, you know, it's like, well, this would be an unlikely plot twist or, uh, but you know, it's just, you know, my dad and my grandfather just, they just told me what happened, you know, and, and just trying, I didn't have to invent anything for replay. And I also, I didn't, uh, like, I didn't let myself, like, I didn't want to kind of soup it up by saying, oh, let's make this, uh, you know, the scene in the trenches a little more dangerous, you know, let's create a little love interest here where there wasn't one, you know, the things that, you know, as a Hollywood screenwriter, you know, one might do for a movie for replay. I didn't do any of that. I really wanted to stick to what they had told me. And, and it, it's, you know, it just speaks so profoundly about, I mean, there's things that, as you say, would never have thought of, but, but, but as, as soon as you hear it, you, you know that it's true. It feels true. Yeah. I was thinking about the, the stamp collecting. And that goes on in the book and how he's like, here's my extras. You can have these. Oh, it's so exciting. And then later, I, I'm, I'm going to buy his collection. <laughs> I'm going to buy these extras for way more money than they're, they're worth. And you kind of, as a reader, you know what's going on there. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that a cousin who who, uh, who was living in Cannes, you know, at, when my dad and his aunt were penniless in Nice, came and visited and wanted to give them money. But my but my dad's aunt, you know, out of pride, you know, wouldn't take any money. She said, no, 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 we're fine. We have everything we need. You know, that, that was her upbringing, you know, to, you know, to, you know, to, to not, you know, to not, not take the money. And so, and so he went and, uh, you know, looked, uh, asked my dad, you know, who was, you know, 10 to show him his stamp collection. And then he saw a stamp. He said, oh, that that's an incredibly rare stamp that I've been looking for for years. And, and so he, uh, you know, he, got my dad to, you know, a kid, you know, to sell it to him for a thousand francs. And and when uh, my dad's aunt found out about it, she was like, she was upset. She was angry that he, that her cousin had gotten around her that way. Cause he's like, oh, no, 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 a deal is a deal. <laughs> so she had to keep this thousand franc note that he, you know, he'd given in exchange for, you know, a perfectly ordinary stamp. And, you know, they all knew it, but she was, she was uh, you know, she pretend, and I think she pretended to be more angry than she was because at the same time she appreciated that he had found such a clever way to, to kind of get around it. And of course, you know, at the heart of it is just like generosity and caring. Like, you know, the reality is they were hungry and he did want to make their life easier. So to me, there's just so, so much about that old, uh, 
you know, sort of that old world Viennese culture, you know, and kind of the quaint, uh, well, you know, the sense of humor and the ways that they had of doing things. All of that is in that anecdote, but, you know, I didn't have to invent it because it happened and my dad, you know, told me about it. Well, as a way to wrap up here, maybe we could talk about this practice, I guess, of, of journaling, mm -hmm. you know, and keeping a journal, you know, and the value of that. And I think we've seen <laughs> very clearly in replay that, <laughs> yeah, this, it might not feel so significant at the time when you're keeping a journal like this, but man, does it ever pay off later? Just wondering if you have advice uh, for people that maybe want to start keeping a journal. Yeah, I mean, it's a practice that I, I really recommend to anyone. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, in my own life, it's paid so many dividends. Uh, and the, I mean, I didn't know when I started keeping a journal that, that the computer games that I was trying to make at the time would actually work and get published and would be remembered by people, you know, 30 years later, so that people would actually be interested in a book of my journals with the title, The Making of Prince of Persia. I had no idea. I actually thought I would never show the journals to anyone. And I didn't. I didn't even show it to my, you know, my best friend and roommate, because for me, uh, what I was writing was, was really private, but you know, enough time passed. And, uh, and also, of course, what I published were just excerpts from the journals. There's thousands of more pages of what I, I was in my mind when I was 17, 18, 19 years old that nobody's ever going to read. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Like, yeah. but you do leave a lot of stuff in that I like, wow, I'm kind of impressed you left that in, <laughs> you know, worth, I would say warts and all, but I guess so you did. But what percentage would you say is? Oh boy, I, I don't even I don't even know. But I know that it would be a book of thousands of pages if I included all of my journals. And I, I thought three hundred, you know, was a, a good solid read. But, but I I didn't uh, like censor it with the idea of like wanting to spare anyone's feelings or like trying to make myself seem better or kinder or smarter. Uh, than I really was like I'm, I was fine showing myself as I actually was you know at those ages no I just took out the stuff that it was just that had nothing to do with you know game development or or film or you know or or my kind of creative and career path you know some of it was just it was just purely personal and had and was was about people that the, you know it would be too much to ask you know for the reader to like actually figure out who all those people were and be interested in the cast of characters. So I really, you know, with the title, the making of Karateka, the meeting, making of Prince of Persia, I just tried to select a thread that was uh, sort of relevant to that story. And, and, you know, and then side things like going to see Return of the Jedi, my opinions about Star Wars, you know, the other 80s movies that I was seeing at the time, uh, I kept that in because it's it's relevant, you know, it's cinema, it's it's pop culture, it's, you know, that's, that's sort of the waters that we were all swimming in, you know, at the time that I was trying yeah, to make. Yeah, letters, you, you were writing letters to Rotorbond and, you know, stuff like that, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, one more keep, thing, do, sorry. Do you still keep a journal? I still keep a journal, and... Um, you know, one of the ways uh, that the journal, uh, you know, is, you know, is valuable to me now is because I can pick it up like a, a journal from a, a year ago, three years ago, or even a few weeks ago, and just flip through a few pages. And it's sometimes uh, I just open to a page that I'm actually, oh, I'm glad I picked that up and read that just now because it reminded me, but it, can, it can be anything. It can be, oh, this reminded me of that wonderful party at so-and-so's house and that person I spent three hours talking to I hadn't thought about it since then but here in my journal I wrote great guy you know I should really look him up the next time I'm in you know whatever town and so there's like oh it's like a little message from my past self to my present self like, thanks for that reminder yeah, that's, uh, that's just one, one way but there's so many things you know sometimes uh some difficult period that I went through uh you know a few years ago, rereading it now, you know, come so far. I'm, I'm so grateful for, you know, where we are now compared to where we were then. And, uh, you know, there a perspective that comes from kind of just sort of having this, being able to flip back instantly and see what was on my mind at some date in the past. It, it's really, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good to have. And even if you never show your journal to anyone, even if you never reread it, I think just the act of
kind of, mm -hmm. and it, I think it helps us see the arc of our lives, you know, not just as we're, you know, in, in the moment as we're living it, which of course, you know, like we want to be in the moment, but somehow I think being aware of the, you know, that these moments are all on a timeline can actually paradoxically can help us appreciate that. And it can remind us that this moment that we're living right now is only happening now. And, and, you know, tomorrow that too will be in the past, which is kind of a reminder to live each moment fully. You often hear people say, asking, what would be the one thing you'd want to tell your younger self and blah, blah, blah. But I think it's maybe just as maybe more valuable to say, what would my younger self want to tell me? <laughs> you know, it's just fantastic stuff. But yeah, thanks so much, Jordan. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Oh, thank you. I've, I've enjoyed it. The hour flew by. Yeah, I don't know. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention that we didn't get to? Man, we've covered a lot. You know, I would say that for anyone listening who's interested in like wanted to know more about some of uh, these topics on uh, at my website, jordanmechner.com. Uh, there's a bunch of tabs at the top, which, uh, you know, lead, you know, I've, I've put up uh, pages about Prince of Persia, The Last Express, Karateka, and uh, all of the graphic novels. There's a library that contains a lot of archival and uh, making of uh, materials from these games. And then you can also sort of see the, I've got a newsletter that you can subscribe to and that'll have sort of the new releases. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. There's the lost crown and, and also the new graphic novels that are coming out. So uh, yeah. So, so I, and I keep adding to that site. It's kind of an archive ongoing archival curating effort. Oh yeah. Library. I'm pretty yeah, sure. Here's the, here's the 20 tips. Yeah. And the, oh, no, the 10 tips, but here, here's the longer version. There's my 20 game development tips. Awesome stuff. You know, I've got wall wallpapers and screensavers that uh, can download. Ah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, some videos. Uh, yeah, there's there, there's some of the rotoscope footage from uh, Prince of Persia. It's, uh... yeah, I saw one of your videos. I think you brought some people back. Or, was it your brother? Somebody had brought back. Yeah, the, well, here, here's my brother uh, there in this uh, jumping video. <laughs> Those are great. <laughs> yeah, I really, you know, I watched the, the, the I love the, the digital eclipse uh, making of uh, parts where it's you and your dad sitting in front, sitting at the piano. <laughs> it's just, yeah, so I'm so it's, glad that that project uh, gave us the chance to yeah, do that. It's so heartwarming. All right. <laughs> Well, thanks again, Jordan. Been a pleasure. Hope you'll keep right. in touch. Yeah, thank you so much. Maybe I'll. Are you? Am I going to pop up in your journal? Is there a possibility? I, I'm sure I will write in my journal. <laughs> okay. I'll never chat that. <laughs> and if I ever wonder, you know, well, when did I do that? Oh, there will be the proof. <laughs>
All right, got some lots of stuff. It's been a couple of weeks. Feels like it's been an eternity. <laughs> uh, a lot of good stuff. I got Miko up first here with the update about Fallout Vault 13. Now, I've talked about this off and on, but now we have the demo that you can download and try out. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, it's they've taken a it's a total conversion mod for Fallout 4 that remakes and reimagines the first two or uh, Fallout 1 rather in uh, Fallout 4's engine. I say, remember Fallout 1, one of the greatest games of all time? Well, now you can play it in the Fallout 4 engine. And apparently they've done a dynamite job with this. Uh, so if the demo only has the first uh, world that they plan to bring out, I think they're going to do another... Uh, yeah, I guess, there's, I guess there's five total. Uh, so this is just the first one, but I think it's already enough there for you to really get excited about. Check it out, see what you think. You can revisit several locations from the original game. Vault 13, Vault 15, Shady Sands. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, the con base and explore everything and everywhere in between uh, so thank you miko for that pretty awesome fallout vault 13. Uh, next up pani uh, writes in about war tells the pits <laughs> now i don't know if i would want to name a game the pits because you know you're kind of setting yourself up for that inevitable reviewer uh, quip about how the title fits the gameplay but anyway hopefully that won't be the case here uh, so this will be released on August 22nd, and as you know, I love the first War Tales, one of the best of the original game, whatever you want to call it, uh, one of the best uh, CRPG, sort of hybrid games. There's kind of a strategy uh, element to it, but I just loved it. So much fun. I really got absorbed into it. Uh, so I'm excited about this expansion, or DLC, I guess. Uh, dive into the black markets where the wealthiest brigands in the five kingdoms hold secret battles. Uh, so this is mostly about combat, I believe. Uh, 25 meticulously designed tactical battles that will test your mastery of war tells. That kind of sounds like an expert uh, expert mod or a way to really test your prowess uh, with the game. So that'll be fun. Coming out August 22nd, just a couple days after yours truly uh, has a birthday. <laughs> is I have a birthday coming up on August 20th. So a couple days later, hopefully I will be playing The Pits. And not writing a quippy little review where I say, <laughs> well, it was never has a game been more aptly named. <laughs> no. Uh, and then finally, it's a really cool. So you remember Julia Mina, uh, Minamata, Minamata? I interviewed her uh, four years ago. I interviewed her four years ago. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, about her game, The Crimson Diamond. Uh, so that is set to release on August 15th. And so hopefully I'll have enough time to play that before uh, I get to the, the pits. But if you're not familiar with this, go back and watch my episode with her. Uh, but it's an EGA text parser game, mystery adventure game, where you play as an amateur geologist and reluctant detective named Nancy Maple. So kind of Nancy Drew and Miss, uh, <laughs> Miss, is it Miss Marple or Miss Maple? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Marple, but anyway, maybe that's a little bit of a homage to those great detectives. I love uh, uh, both those uh, series. Let's see. Um, looking to see if there's any more details about it. Explore the lodge and its environs, its environs uh, to evaluate the diamond claim and maybe solve a mystery or two along the way. A cozy mystery that encourages reading and engaging in the story over <laughs> devious <laughs> arcade challenges. So uh, this is just great. You know, I know how hard uh, she's worked on this and really done some fabulous artwork. And ev everything is really looking great with this. Uh, so wishing uh, Julia success with the Crimson Diamond. Set again to officially release on August 15th. And I think it's on Steam. I know it's on Steam. I don't know for sure if it's on GOG, but we can check that out. But uh, one way or the other, if you like retro uh, style adventure games, you're definitely going to want to pick this up. All right, what about that ale? Uh, well, uh, this one is not really an ale, <laughs> but, uh, but I thought it was, it looked fun enough. I thought I'd try it on the show. Uh, it's a Dungeons and Dragons themed beverage, 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 called Heroes Potion of Power cherry lime flavor so i think this is an energy drink uh, let's see boston american corporations got wizards of the coast branding on it <laughs> maybe it's poisonous i don't know 
Uh, let's see. Carbonated water, sugar, citric acid, and natural flavor. Potassium sorbate, potassium benzoate, gum. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I think the most interesting ingredient here is glycerol ester of wood rosin. Because I love my gly glycerol ester of wood rosin. You know, that just sounds uh, delightful, doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, anyway, I just couldn't pass this up. 160 calories. Uh, so, how much is a regular, like, Coke or Dr. Pepper? I, I don't feel like it's that, or maybe it's that. I feel like the Dr. Pepper has more calories than this. Uh, but anyway, let's just open this sucker up and I'll pour it in the glass. I'm not going to taint my horn with this because it's, I don't want to make my horn sticky. That sounds a little bit <laughs> strange. <laughs> you know, as soon as, it's come, as soon as it come out of my mouth, I'm like, I don't know about wording it that way, but anyway, we don't want a sticky horn. Sneaky horn, yes. All right, well, looks kind of like a, maybe a big red. Not a good bubble action there. It's kind of a pinkish, more pinkish than blood. I can smell the sugar. <laughs> uh, it does kind of, it said cherry lime. You know, that's what it smells like. If you ever go to a Sonic, a Sonic drive-in, a pretty cool little restaurant chain. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they have these things they call limeades, I believe, uh, or slushy kind of a drink. Uh, we don't have them here, so I've forgotten what they, what they call those things, but kind of an icy, like a slush puppy type of beverage. Uh, that's what this smells like. Uh, very, <laughs> uh, very cloying. Uh, yeah, cherry and lime. I mean, it smells just exactly what it says. Let's taste it. I'm guessing it's going to taste like it smells. Huh. Well, that is, uh, you know, this is not as bad as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a, a pretty uh, sophisticated taste on this. Let me try it again. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I was almost set up not to like this because, uh, <laughs> you know, Wizards of the Coast and all that, but this is actually not bad. Try it again. You know, I don't... I actually really like this. Uh, I, I thought it would be sort of overpoweringly sweet and sugary, but um, it's not really. It's got a really potent flavor. Uh, you really taste that cherry uh, and lime. It does kind of taste like the, the limeade I was talking about earlier. Not at all like a big red. I can't think of a soda that uh, this really tastes like. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of got its own thing going. You know, maybe a little bit like a Cherry 7-Up, if you tried that. Uh, but I think I like this better than the Cherry 7-Up. Well, anyway, it's not bad. Uh, I think this would be fun if you uh, are having a little D&D &D night. Maybe you don't want uh, alcohol, but you want something that's uh, a little more thematically relevant, I guess, than a you know, Cherry 7-Up would be. I mean, you might check this out. You know, the more I think about it, isn't kind of a... Uh, Mountain Dew and 7-Up, kind of the unofficial drink of <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons anyway. Uh, so it's kind of in that ballpark. Uh, but again, I kind of like it better than just a regular soda. I don't know if it's supposed to have energy uh, drink qualities to it. But yeah, it's, it's perfectly fine. Uh, you know, I'd be happy to drink uh, this as I'm playing some D&D uh, &D with the friends. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to try to rate this because it's not an ale and it just seems kind of apples and oranges type situation but uh, not a bad drink <laughs> if you want something uh, with D&D &D on it uh, and again I was expecting something that would be pretty crappy you know just uh, expecting that they would be hoping the license would uh, would carry sort of a mediocre uh, drinking experience but uh, it actually tastes good um, you know, it's, it's, it's just not bad. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, plus, you end up with a pretty cool can with that great artwork on it uh, that you've probably seen if you're a D&D &D art collector. Now it's on a can. It makes me wonder, though, do, do they have... Uh, is there a, an ale or a real uh, uh, 
a beer <laughs> or maybe some wine or something uh, that Wizards of the Coast has licensed the D&D &D stuff for. You know, I actually don't know that. If you know the answer to that, let me know uh, to keep an eye out uh, for it if it exists. You know, I kind of doubt it, though, since they might want they might want to avoid that for their franchise, but, but I don't know. Uh, anyway, Potion of Heroes, Potion of Power, not bad. All right, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was, since, you know, this is so much about Persia, with Prince of Persia and everything. And, and by the way, that is a good movie. <laughs> it's kind of got middle, middle ratings, you know, on uh, uh, the various review sites, but I just thought it was a lot of fun. Um, so I was looking for quotes from Persian authors, Persian poets, and uh, one that comes up again and again is named uh, Rumi. Uh, I'm probably not pronouncing any of this right, but it looks like Jalal ad-Din Muhammad Rumi, a Sufi mystic and an Islamic dervish and a great poet. I know he's a real thing. I do have a friend who uh, is a Persian scholar uh, from Iran. He's always talking about Rumi as well. Uh, so I contacted him. He hasn't, I don't know when he saw my uh, text, but I was, I was asking him for some great quotes too. So I might uh, have a supplement <laughs> where I throw in a few more uh, quotes from uh, from Rumi. But anyway, this is one I found online. I really, really like this. I'm not going to try to read the uh, original language here. This is a translation, of course. But it goes something like this. Raise your words, not your voice. It is rain that grows flowers, not thunder. So ponder on that, and I'll see you guys next time. solution would be to kiss me, then kill me. But I have a better solution. I kill you!